panels who think there are areas of the United States that have vast economic potential if the right jobs were being filled, but nonetheless face a an unwillingness on the part of domestic workers to move to the locales and do certain kinds of low-skilled jobs, and second of all, a difficulty to under like you know a real political difficulty in pulling back wage restrictions and stuff to be able to make local people fill their jobs. So we're going to try and fix this problem by filling those jobs with foreign workers. What policy do you support in this debate? We think the visas we're going to grant look basically as follows, right? We can restrict them to live in a certain area and do certain jobs, we can restrict them to work in certain industries, and we're going to target these visas and allocate them on the basis of the following. Where we think there are jobs that can be fulfilled that do the most economic good and are particularly valuable jobs, right? and they may even be temporal things, right? For instance, if we think we specifically need to prop up a local economy for our development to occur in the future, governments will have full control over the, like, the, the standards of these sorts of visas and so on and so forth. I want to take about two arguments. First of all, filling critical holes for the country, and second of all, why this will be better for workers in the long run. First of all, why this is good for the country. I have four reasons here. The first is that there are immense labor market gaps. Okay. Sure. One, in terms of like uh, orders of magnitude, how many people are we talking about? And two, uh, are you still having regular visas for workers for other... I would, would certainly have regular visa to other people in terms of magnitude of people. I imagine it would be like order of magnitude thousands. I don't know how many specific locales there would be. I think there are lots of them. We're talking about a large number of people, right? Probably deployed to make like large areas of the debate of the country. Sorry, much better. Sorry, labor market gaps as I was talking about. There are many low skilled jobs in things we're talking about like southern agriculture or Midwest manufacturing, right? Where A, there are not enough people who will either live there or are willing to move there to do to those jobs, or B, people are unwilling to do those jobs for sort of culture reason, right? Because they feel a particular stigma in working in the field in a job that might be seasonal or temporary, or the fact is they view something or they have an aspiration to get up. Or third of all, just because those jobs might be seasonal, right, temporary, they might not have the capacity to like live in one place for half the year and another place in a different bit of the year. This means that there are huge deadweight losses, right, because there are parts of the economy that are not unlocked. There are economically productive things that could be generating large amounts of money for the economy, and those jobs simply go unfilled. If there was domestic will to fill those positions, they probably would have been filled. But we would know the US, with its aging population, is systemically going to struggle, both now and into the future, to fill these situations and fill very valuable things, like Producing agricultural stuff very productively is incredibly important to your country and saves you a lot of money. Having a manufacturing industry creates lots of secondary goods, and that's incredibly important. Why? Second of all, in Why? terms of rejuvenating areas, we consider things like southern agriculture and Midwest manufacturing. It is like th there is some truth to the notion that like a lot of these things have been undercut by, for instance, co competition from foreign countries because they can simply hire workers at a low wages, and that has led to large portions of the earth that have been systematically destroyed. So sure. once economically productive, they have not been able to compete and found themselves locked out of the trajectory in the future. That has had two consequences. Consequences. The first consequence is it meant that it has caused general economic devastation, right? Because once you pull the heart out of these regions and you stop like the basic jobs are filled because they're no longer productive and those jobs move offshore, every subsidiary industry that relied on that basic sort of demand of the people who live there on getting jobs and wanting to buy things in the future cuts out. And second of all, it props up all the political unrest that people who feel as though their local like their local areas are being destroyed and there's no economic future for those. We protect the situation, right? Because we put that beating heart back into those areas. We fill those local jobs that are required to have secondary jobs because if you have a low-skilled job, you'll buy things, there'll be more jobs in the local area, it'll prop up demand, it'll mean the more investment will come to the area because more people there. We fix those problems, we fix A, the economic devastation that is being wrought, and second of all, the political like, precursors to people like Trump and bad politicians who often implement policies that are far worse for these regions overall. The third reason I want to I want to talk about in this argument is why it makes it more viable to build infrastructure. A large part of what the US needs, no thank you, to improve the quality of life of people in the country is the capacity to deploy infrastructure to connect different parts of a very large country and make it such that things can be moved around across the country and there's general economic capacity for the US to improve. The problem is as following. Infrastructure is only effective when the amount of people that it is being like benefiting is worth it for the cost that it like, subsumes. Right? The problem is that in lots of these areas that are dying, as more and more people are forced into the cities, the actual economic benefit of building infrastructure, so thank you to rural areas in the United States, for instance, is going down and down and down. What we need to do is prop up the economic viability of those regions so it makes more sense for the government to start deploying infrastructure in lots of local that increases the general economic viability and productivity of the country Overall, last of all, I'll take opening a, sec uh, opening a second. Better tax collection, right? We think that a lot of these jobs are simply done in a non-formal way if they are not allowed to be done on these sorts of visas, right? Because there is some underlying economic demand to fill these sorts of jobs. The problem is that when those jobs are done in an informal way, the government gets none of the benefits of actually that economic activity being produced, right? Well, all the money we could be getting, or governments could reallocate or redeploy, is simply not given to them, so they lose out that stuff. Sure. If these industries are as 
potentially profitable and productive as you suggest they are, why have wages fallen in those industries shrunk in the first place? No, because there's a difference between being productive and getting a very highly paid job, right? For instance, it could be the case that having many people working a job below the minimum wage had yeah. aggregate economic benefits to your country in terms of all the secondary stuff that I want to talk about, like producing additional jobs and just having people in jobs and producing stuff that means that domestic product, like domestic like, produce, for instance, is cheaper for people who live in your country. Nonetheless, those jobs might not be specifically paid a large amount of money. That is the problem we fix specifically on our side of the house. Second of all, why this is better for workers. The first thing I want to observe here is that the reality we have to contend with in this debate is that but for this policy, these jobs are simply filled by illegals by and large, right? That is the status quo and that is the continuing thing into the future. The problem is the people who work in these illegal status simply have very few legal rights and the capacity to access them. That means they don't do things like access their health care rights, they don't access things like policing, and they often do not totally get the protections of labour things. So for instance, if you're illegally working, you don't all, all the protections of every other labor law other than the minimum wage stuff itself. What our visas specifically do is they give them a legal place to do these jobs they want to do anyway, which means A, they can access all of the primary rights in terms of healthcare and policing, but second of all, they get all of the secondary benefits, the protections of labor standards, right? That means that the exchange in this debate is between sometimes people will be doing the same jobs and adding the same economic benefit, but even if it's mitigated, even if they symmetrize it completely on their side house, we let them do those jobs with the labor protection, with the basic standards and defenses that every other worker in the country gets, and we defend them morally from the sort of abuses that are likely to occur when you are illegal, and if you don't do your job or you do something to piss off your boss, you could simply be deported. The second thing we want to talk about is we think, in general, we believe in a principled right of these people to work, right? Given the capacity, we would probably quite happily remove things like the minimum wage, by and large, right? But for the political difficulty of doing these sorts of things, and the general, like, annoyance that it would cause lots of people, right? What we think, specifically, though, is that there is no reason why someone who lives in a different country should be denied the capacity to make their life better and improve their standing simply because a border has stopped them, right? Or because there are, like, legal barriers to entering the country. We are quite happy to stand up and say that even if they can demonstrate some like piddling economic harm or like nuisance to people who say live in the United States, there is a very strong moral case to say that to the extent we are bringing people from say South America who are incredibly poor and incredibly worse off, giving them jobs that allow them to improve their quality of life, put their children in good schools and improve that quality of life for the next generation and the next generation, that is something we should welcome and like, embrace. And let's be realistic that what this debate is about, right? There are oodles of places in the United States that are incredibly valuable and have a lot of untapped potential. But they rely on people to do jobs that are particularly unpleasant and people do not want to do. We fix that problem. <laughs> Every single business in the United States would be more profitable if it could pay its workers $2 an hour rather than 15 That isn't a reason for driving down wages, because we recognize the US wants to maintain a standard of living commensurate with what it's expected, rather than driving for higher economic growth at the cost of a working class who is already suffering. They're suffering enough about globalization within their country, meaning they can't find work at the legal wage which they're obliged to accept. Two, point, uh, two points in this speech. Firstly, why do we think this leads to mass unemployment in the United States and what the political effects of that are like to be? Secondly, what the effects are on migrant laborers, migrant laborers, why they are worse off than in the status quo, and why the countries they come from are worse off than in the status quo. Before that, responses to what side proposition is given us. So firstly, philosophically, look, we would observe that making a country's economy grow is only desirable if it has a benefit for the population of the country. So yes, the industries in this country might become more profitable. It does not follow that should be tolerated at the cost of providing mass unemployment for the working class, meaning they are unable to gain a meaningful quality of life. Secondly, they tell us this: we have a moral obligation to allow uh, entry for these people. Firstly, this fails to uh, this fails to interact properly with their policy, which is allowing a very limited number of people. If they think we have a moral obligation for free borders, this is not a policy which is morally legitimate to pursue. Secondly, it is a bizarre way to help people to ask them to come in and work as indentured labourers for two dollars an hour, and we're going to demonstrate where they're going to be actively worse off on their side of the house. Thirdly, the US government is not a morally neutral actor. Rather, it is a body composed of the population of the US and therefore has a duty to that population of the US. It is not making a moral choice, it is making a choice about its owners, who are the, popular, who are the people who have created it, who serve it, who are enslaved by it. By virtue of living under the government, being asked to die for the government, paying taxes for the government, that government 
gain his duties towards you. The duty is not to prioritize other people over you because they happen to be cheaper, but rather to do what it takes to provide you with a higher quality of life. Finally, we would note that destroying the US economy is not a viable objective from a charity point of view. The reasoning being the continued health of the global economy, no thanks, is necessary for continuing charitable donations and continuing development in the third world. If the US working class is no longer able to consume, or the lower middle class is no longer able to consume, firstly, you get no more charitable donation, and secondly, you don't get investment or funds available to lift people out of poverty in other areas. Secondly, in terms of more economically productive. Let's be very clear, we do not think the future of the US economy is picking grapes in Mississippi at $3 an hour. If they think that's the future of the US economy, they need to rethink and produce a viable model whereby the US is going to be able to uh, compete in terms of skills and terms of providing something the world wants rather than lowering itself to the level of other countries. We think that the reason why these jobs aren't being filled is because they are just not worth doing at the wages which are being offered. Sure, they could be done by other people who were shifted, shipped into the country, although incidentally there's no minimum wage for agriculture anywhere, and that was apparently the only thing they wanted to talk about, so it's unclear how that example developed. But we don't think that would be economically beneficial for the United States if it drove down wages for everything else as well and forced that. Alternatively, we can mechanize these industries and have fewer skilled jobs being made available which could provide real employment. Uh, notably, or we think this is not the beating heart of the US economy. Finally, in terms of illegal migrants, look, these people are not better off on their side of the house. When they are illegal migrants, they have flexibility. So, yes, you are not, you don't have full rights as a citizen. You do, on the other hand, have the ability to swap employers if your employer abuses you. On the other hand, on their side of the house, you have a specific um, visa, visa sponsor who you can't change. On neither side are you fully integrated into society, you don't have the protection of the government. But on the last side, at least you have the protection of the market, whereby your employer has a duty to treat, has an incentive to treat you de decently, less to you defect. Go for it, closing. Yeah, so the way an economy works is not that there is one industry that is absolutely valuable. It's all about comparative advantage. So if the US can get that in its agricultural markers by now not having the problem of expensive labor, why isn't that a good thing for its economy? So I do not see what the benefit to the United States is of having a large number of people picking grapes at like five dollars an hour when previously someone else would have been doing it at ten dollars an hour. There's no benefit for the people who are involved who are being trafficked into the country. There's no benefit for the labor force of the country as a whole can't be employed. So first when we think people are going to be paid next to nothing and what the effect of that is on American employment. We would note three reasons why people would accept very, very low wages. Firstly, because people associate the United States with freedom, which means they will pay through the nose to get there, even if it means they're being paid two dollars an hour. Thirdly, because people will desire to get in and then overstay their visa later, and therefore they'll bank on future gains and they'll be prepared to accept very low wages. Finally, we would just know how overwhelmingly low wages are in many parts of the world. The, the, living, the minimum wage in the state of New York is about $15 an hour. In many countries, that's about what you'd earn in a week. In some countries, that's about what you'd earn in a month. Which means that the incentives, even if the wages are much, much lower, are still for people to uh, much, much, uh, are much, much lower than Americans. Are still for people to accept these wages because it's what they're being offered and it's the best they have. Moreover, these people have no political capital. They have no ability to vote. They're unlikely to unionize. And you, as the employer, can literally get them deported and shipped back out of the country if you wish to render them unemployed. And they have no social security within the United States. States. This means this is a tremendously attractive group of workers for any employer to take. They're much cheaper, they're much more likely to do exactly what you say, they're probably prepared to much, much work much harder because they're in such an appalling situation. The result is that wherever possible you will employ this group in preference to American workers. And you have a, the lowest skilled portion of the American workforce, constituting maybe 30 million to 50 million people, will find it near impossible to get a job. Why? Because the number of people with very, very similar skill set to them, who are being paid maybe a third, maybe even less, of what they're able to make their labor available for legal. They are priced out of the marketplace by the government which has sworn to protect them. Secondly, in terms of why this is appalling for migrants, objectively worse either than not migrating or in the status quo. So we would know that people get themselves hugely in debt in order to get bro brokers to get them to the United States. Consistently what we see with people migrating to jobs even when the wages are very, very low because they just have that positive association with Western countries or the US. When they're in the US, they'll be being paid very little and their employer will have enormous power over them because they'll be the ability at any point to retract their visa, which will offer them the ability to withhold wages, to take away their passport, to make the work extremely hard. 
And ultimately, therefore, these people are taken to the US, they work very hard, get paid very little, and ultimately they sick and get less efficient and are deported by their employer when they can find someone cheaper or more effective, effi uh, more, effi more efficient and fast. That is worse for them, either than staying at home and being paid a maybe slightly lower wage, but at least having a government which will look out for them, as opposed to a government which is looking for opportunity to deport them, or that being uh, that migrating illegally or under a slightly more generous legal program and being able to get real opportunities for their families. Very proud to oppose. Okay, I thank the Leader of Opposition for their remarks. I'll call upon the Deputy Prime Minister here. here. The price to pay for living in a globally integrated country which is able to import cheap goods from around the world is that you also need to compete on a global basis. And the reality is that American workers today do need to compete with lower skilled workers who live in developing countries. The question is whether we should have them competing with labour within the United States or outside of the United States. Our contention is that we'd be better off developing industries around broad sectors of the United States where poor American workers at the moment could pay a role in the growth of those regions rather than have those jobs simply being moved offshore to China entirely where the American workers get no part of that pie. Two points in this speech. First, I'm going to look at the economy. Secondly, I'm going to look at why this improves um, rights for our workers. First, on the economy. So what they've ignored is the fact that it isn't a case where... Um, we simply have one industry that we've chosen. The reality of the modern economy is that every given business relies upon other businesses for a huge part of its services. So for example, a huge part of the US economy is based upon B2B or business to business services, which are providing services for um, other companies. So these are areas that we don't necessarily see, but form a huge part of the economy. Things like the logistics industry, things like um, IT support and coaching industries, things like um, the ability to be able to get advice on different types of agricultural products, be able to gain information about all the various ways that business could be optimised. These are jobs which are often not necessarily particularly skilled, but are jobs which often require relationships which are hugely important to form. And these are jobs that we see enormous potential at the moment for relatively well, uh, relatively poorly off workers in America being able to fill these positions. Why are we able to do this? Because at the moment, if you're running a B2B services firm, you're unlikely to be able to provide the localised knowledge on logistics that's necessary to be able to help a firm that is operating manufacturing within China. But what you are able to do is able to provide the assistance, whether that's renting out vans, whether that's providing information or doing testing or so of soil types that might be able to help optimise services within areas of Southern California. This provides employment for a bunch of ancillary industries which we don't necessarily see and think about on a day-to-day -day basis but are hugely important. So what we do is we ensure that the um, workers that relatively poorly off domestic American workers are going to compete with are happening inside the country and that's a part of the game that they're able to get on. We're able to cluster more people around better infrastructure because it now becomes affordable to be able to build infrastructure that wouldn't have otherwise been worth building in those, com in those areas of the country because there wasn't sufficient economic demand to justify it and that produces spillover benefits for everyone. There's more construction, it's easier to get goods from one place of the country to another and that helps everyone it means the U.S. is more likely to be able to compete because the problem that the U.S. faces in the era of Trump where we're going to have relatively limited immigration and ultimately falling um, birth rates is that it's increasingly difficult for the U.S. to be able to grow its economy domestically and create new positions in a more efficient and more mechanised world. What we need to be doing is ensuring there are more jobs that rely upon relationships and part of that is including more of the economy within the U.S. So that include, involves having more of these workers around so we're able to ensure better results for those people, yes. Do you object to minimum wage in general? Why or why not? So we think there are some benefits to minimum wages within particular cases. For example, within um, the uh, Pacific Coast, there are um, many minimum wages which are socially useful for reasons like the fact that people don't tend to fully shop around for jobs because they're averse to moving from one employer to another because they're often quite happy with a cosy relationship. These mean that um, markets with, for employment aren't fully efficient and as a result work, uh, companies are able to pay lower wages than the fair 
fair market price. That's a reason why we might have minimum wages in certain situations. We don't believe this applies within the case of workers who are coming in from overseas from desperate situations who are able to get enormous gain out of being part of that system in the first place, who are just happy to be there earning a wage 10 times what they'd be able to earn in Honduras. We believe that's a clear benefit and one where there's not the same case for minimum wage protection as there is protecting a worker who might not be sure about moving from one place to another because of uncertainty about employers. What did they suggest they, we could do? So they said that we could just have fewer higher skilled jobs by investing in mechanisation within manufacturing. We believe this is a terrible idea for the very workers that they claim to be wanting to help within the US because what this would mean was that these workers would simply be unemployed because if you replace um, their jobs with increased tech rather than workers, you're, not go you're just going to be able to find yourself in a situation where those people are out of jobs. What we'd rather have is a situation where there is growth, there are more people within the area, there's more domestic demand for all of the other services, even basic leisure services, which people are often able to compete in. The services that we use day to day, things like food service, retail, all of those things, which workers within the US will also be able to be a part of as a result of the, these new de, um, foreign workers being part of that system. Now let's look at what's good for workers, and I'll take a PI from Rafi, even though you didn't take one from us. <laughs> from an perspective, how is an employer incentivized to treat an employee who they can physically have removed from the country at any time? So they can't because you assumed that what we were doing was tying these visas to a particular sponsor. What John laid out very clearly is what we were doing was saying within a particular geographic area, within a particular set of industries, people would be allowed to apply for these visas and come into the country. We believe there are probably many orange farms within Southern California that you could choose from and would in fact have more choice than the situation at the moment where workers come in illegally into Southern California, sometimes have their passports taken by their employers and have no no ability to be able to report abuses of their labour because they know that if they do so, they're going to be taken by a federal agent and put over the border and sent back to Honduras or to Mexico. That's the reality that we're talking about. Rafi says these people are going to live objectively worse lives than if they stayed in their initial situation. We believe this is absolute nonsense because of the fact that even relatively small wages within the United States tend to be far better than earning um, even smaller amounts within countries like Mexico. But furthermore, even if you're earning the same wage within Mexico, you also don't have the ability to be able to access the rule of law, to be able to access fairness in the same way, to be protected and feel safe. Those kind of protections that we take for granted, protections of your property and person that are a basic part of countries like the United States but are often unavailable to people living in developing countries. The reason people are so desperate to get their Rafi is because the deal they're getting is so good, because they're able to access something that even domestic, though domestic workers consider it to be abhorrent, they're able to provide a benefit for their employer and a benefit for themselves. The workers win, the, economies win, the economy wins, and employers win. This is a win-win-win situation, very proud to propose. Um, I don't think you can measure utility or happiness or the success of the community by a matter of trade flows by the amount of money going in infrastructure, even if opening government's benefits all came through. Because for the average person who is not taking these supposedly incredibly profitable and incredibly productive useful jobs, not exploiting the opportunities that opening government claims are so fruitful, when they see people coming in and, and taking their jobs in, in a greater number with the support of their government, who is meant to be in, on their side protecting them, and with the support of companies that are no longer providing any opportunities and, and now depressing the wages they could be facing, we think there's utter misery in those communities. Three things in this speech. Firstly, on how the communities they wanted to protect or, or, or the kind of areas that they claimed were un, unexploited. And I'd just like to note, the kind of language of opening government was there's an efficiency problem here because these places are underutilised. It was never phrased in the terms of what it felt like to be those people or what happened to them. It was always about allocating resources to produce the most efficient progress. The second thing I'm going to talk about is about workers who get these visas and the workers who don't that might remain in that country as illegal immigrants. And lastly, I'm going to touch on developing countries and, and how competitive they are internationally. Firstly, on those communities. 
Opening opposition, uh, government has brought a couple of, of things to me. The first real claim here is that there's some kind of huge underutilised resources that for cultural reasons people won't be taking up these supposedly profitable jobs. I think opening government has done economics, enough economics in their time to realise that if these industries were so profitable, assuming workers who, American workers, have a lot more bargaining power, as Rafi explained, than the kind of immigrants they will be bringing in, we would expect those wages you know, to be rising accordingly, to be attracting the kind of opportunities and investments that they're not. And that points to us in opening opposition to say that in the grand scheme of things, the reason why these areas are flailing economically in the medium term is not for cultural unwillingness, it's for the fact that the US in the medium term is unable to compete with other countries and, and needs to have, no, and obviously there's a bit of growing pain here guys, but needs to make some moves in, in order to become a more developed economy, in order to invest in different kinds of in industries. And that's what Rafi told you we would do in the alternative as opposed to bringing in the kinds of infrastructure that might support a very narrow set of kind of industries that were unlikely to be competitive in the future. The kinds of driving forces that are, are making these industries uh, or are likely to lead to growth in these industries are things like technological innovations, things like mechanisation, because realistically, however many people, in the thousands as they would say, that you're likely to be bringing into these countries, you're unable to compete with the literal millions of people in India, in China, the literal millions of people working in agriculture, in Africa, no, and those industries were not the future of the US, nor were they the future of these particular communities. But the second thing we would tell you is that not only is it economically useless, it, it's politically disastrous. Tom has this, like, sorry, John has this throwaway line about the preconditions for Trump never arising if these communities were so economically successful. We suspect that if you're a person in London, Wisconsin, I'm just picking a European town and then a state in the US, I'm happy about with that if you are unable to have a job and the jobs of your friends or the wages are going down because they're now having to compete with people being paid three dollars an hour, no, if, 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 okay. if more people, no thank you, with the government support and with the support of industry are flowing in and, and in some cases you might be a little bit racist or more inclined to at least racism under the conditions opening government gives you, you're unlikely to be doing things like voting for protections for illegal immigrants, you're unlikely to be doing things like voting to expand immigration, you're more likely to have the very conditions they opposed. Their third claim Point. here was about infrastructure. Point. No, we just reject that infrastructure is decided by this team in opening government. It's not like anyone looks at a map by population and efficiency in spreadsheets. It's often decided by much more subtle things. For instance, you're likely to do things like buy up uh, infrastructure in, in purple counties, which are less likely to be purple in the instance where you have whole swathes of the population that are politically disenfranchised that cannot vote. No, it's people horse trading or, or over particular in infrastructure deals. And, 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 and that's more likely to happen, no, when you have these states that are at this particular point in history, maybe economically flailing, but so politically vital, they're going to be seeing that improvement anyway. So. Uh, before, that, that's to say that these communities they're talking about are failing for reasons beyond anything the government can help and are more likely to fail in the future. I'll take opening. Are you better or worse off if there are now new retail jobs that have been created in your otherwise dying community as a result of many new workers coming in from overseas demanding goods and services? The extent of these retail jobs, for the reasons that I'm about to tell you about the conditions these workers will live, are incredibly limited and in fact like a very different kind of, of, of job to that that your community is already set up to provide. You're unlikely to be keeping your jobs, if at all. So. What, what do these workers get and how does that affect the community in, in partially in response to that point of information? A couple of things we told you that were not responded to. The first is that these workers have very little money. That's because they're in debt when they paid for travels and visas and those wages are very long, low structurally. Secondly, they have no political power when they're ununionized, when they can't vote, when they don't have access to lawyers to uphold those contracts. That means that more workers are living in the kinds of conditions opening government opposed. Thirdly, they have no outside options when they do not speak the language as well, when their visa is conditioned, no, on their particular forms of work, when they have no access to social security should they lose their job, when they have no family in the country to live with otherwise and very little state support. Finally, they're just hated, and that, that, that applies to all illegal immigrants, especially the illegal immigrants who may now lose their jobs to illegal immigrants on these visas and don't have access to that security under any case. Uh, yeah. Yeah, your argument assumes that workers are independent when they are undocumented, but if they leave their jobs, their employers threaten to report them to immigration enforcement agencies anyway, so they need to legally be there to have some level of safety. I want to see yeah. what that reporting looks like when employers like, I employed this person illegally, never check their documents. I mean, I doubt any employer is likely to be doing that when they leave. 
Uh, and in, in the case they do, these are people that are likely to be losing their jobs in favour of legal immigrants and are in the exact same situation you pointed out. So that's just to say, workers, the kind of workers they talked about wanting to help are living in practically indentured labour with very little outside options and a political environment that is totally unsuitable to the kind of medium-term change this government wanted. A band-aid of, of, of throwing a little bit of money, perhaps in infrastructure, and throwing a couple of workers into a flailing region is not a long-term strategy for a modernising economy. Lastly, on developing countries. We think best case for this government, what happens is the, the kinds of developing countries, people who they equally thought had a right to labour and a, a right to participate in that global market were made less competitive. But like even if all of their material about wages going down, suddenly a booming agriculture in the US, were, un, were unclear why if you buy their analysis about the importance of, of people having equal rights to that economy, that's important when those countries fail. So proud to stand in opposition. I thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition for their remarks and call upon a member of government to open up the back half of the debate. Here. policy is either going to be one of the most substantial acts of international development in recent history, or going to stop a looming population crisis in the US, you should probably win the debate. Danny and I are going to do both of those things. We're going to extend both in terms of geography and in terms of time, prove why this is a monumentally good idea, most rebuttals integrated, a bit of stuff at the end. Firstly, on remittances, a massive area of the debate, criminally undercovered by the top half, probably the most important thing to talk about. Look. This policy isn't going to substantially protect the number of people who are working in the US or immigrants from countries like Honduras or Nicaragua or Guatemala, where today most of the immigrants we're talking about realistically are from. That's because the comparative is illegal immigration, which happens to a very, very substantial extent on the status quo, occupying many of the same jobs for the same industries. The question then is the status under which these workers are employed. Danny and I are going to change that pretty substantially. We've heard a little bit from opening government why that's really good for the workers individually. That may be, that may be true. That's not anywhere near the most important material in this debate. Most important material in this debate is about the communities back home, their families and their nations more worship. No thank you. Why is this true? Even if we buy the wage is going to be somewhere on the order of magnitude of as low as OO o wants, and we're going to contest that later on, the sheer differences in purchasing power between a country like the US and the kind of countries that workers are like, likely to be coming from are genuinely hugely, hugely substantial, no thank you. This means that any form of money they send back is likely to be incredibly beneficial in terms of providing basic opportunities to their communities. A couple of reasons why on the comparative, they're far more likely to send back a lot more in terms of remittances than the comparison of the illegal immigrants. Three things. Firstly, you go into a hell of a lot of debt to become an illegal immigrant. Yes, that may be true, at least in the short term, to some extent for these contracts, but the sheer amount of money you need to illegally cross a border and find a, find, uh, find a job at the other end is colossal. Secondly, if you know you're likely to be deported, it's very, very uncertain you can have a reliable funding stream for your family. It means your family back home can't make the kinds of long-term investment they potentially could otherwise. Thirdly, when you have access to the financial system, where you can do things like put your wages in index funds, they go up by 7% every year, it means you can send back even larger returns to your family, even if your wage is reasonably small. These things do make a pretty substantial difference. Also, just in terms of like transfer, right? If you could just use, no thank you, a bank transfer, rather than having to get it like in through informal mechanism across the border, where lots of people take cuts along the way, that makes a really fucking big difference in terms of the amount of money you can actually get back. So, even if that, this money is actually a pretty low quantity, this has really transformed these communities. A couple of reasons, though, why it's not. So o, o, o tells us, firstly, that people accept low raises because they love the freedom of the United States. Like, I don't know how stupid they think people living in Central America are, but given they've endured more bombs than the freedom of the United States for the past 50 years, I find that pretty unlikely. <laughs> Secondly, they claim people are going to want to overstay their visas, no thank you, and therefore going to be irrational. That may be true on the status quo, when all the jobs you could previously get as an illegal immigrant are now filled by people from our visa program, that's no longer going to be true, so that incentive doesn't exist. Thirdly, they're just like, these industries have low wages, so they're low, that kind of rebuts itself. Cool. So, with all of that having been done, let's talk about why this is really, really, really important. Because ultimately, this is in many cases the difference between literal starvation, the cases of communities like grossly afflicted by the drug war in a really, really bad way, no thank you, and actually being able to improve their lives. But even beyond that, it just boosts 
moves capital into these countries and boosts local demand in a really substantial way. If people can now spend far, far more money doing things like you know buying food or buying basic services back home in Nicaragua or Guatemala, that means that other industries and businesses around there can start using that money to form themselves and form genuinely self-sustaining economies within those industries, importing capital in what's otherwise. No, thank you. Given that these are countries often without social safety nets, gripped by huge poverty, this is realistically, on human terms, the most important impact in this debate. But here's some stuff on O about why like, the US government has a duty to only care about its own people and no one else. Nonsense. Two reasons why. Firstly, just as humans, we value the fundamental equality of all humans. The logical extension of that is we should care to at least a substantial extent about other human beings. Secondly, though, the United States has really particular duties to countries in Central America. Noting, for example, that Eisenhower in the 1950s basically destroyed the government of Guatemala because of the banana industry. That Reagan in the 1980s basically destroyed Nicaragua and caused like tens of thousands of people to die in human rights violations. All that presumably means there's a substantial duty to help those people, and they're probably most important people in the Bay Area. Opening government tell us this is what makes the Mexican economy outcompete the U.S. in the agricultural sector. You say this is what allows the Mexican economy to develop and become more competitive. Who's right and why? Okay, cool. So we're not. Firstly, we're not talking about Mexico. We're talking about the country I talked about. B. This is like much more about like China and stuff. It's realistically outcompeting us. Mexico is largely operating like parallel industries. It's become like reasonably more economically productive. Otherwise, kind of nonsense. Cool. Secondly, um. I want to talk about the population crisis in the United States, because this is a massive, massive thing that no one's talked about so far in this debate, which is to say that the social security system is currently undergoing a major crisis for a number of reasons, where substantial deficits that are unlikely to be able to be paid. Why is this true? First, people are living longer and longer and longer, and no one's, so thank you, willing to either cut the amount people are paying, or, um, or lower the retirement, or raise the retirement age in any substantial sense. Secondly, the structure of the social security system is one where you continuously pay in so that current generations are paying for previous generations rather than previous generations paying for themselves, which means as more and more people get older and older, the quantity of the deficit gets larger and larger. The result of that is you have far, far less revenue into this system than you did previously. What we do is transfer revenue into this system in a number of ways. Firstly, just if these workers are not illegal, they are paying taxes, that money then goes into this system. Secondly, we think we get special interest groups and businesses on side with broadly using these contracts rather than illegal immigration. We find like a route towards financial viability for them, which means we're likely to get more money out of them in the long term. Thirdly, industries that previously just weren't financially viable will become financially viable, and that pays money into this system. Before I explain why this is really important to take closer. Would people who voted for Trump support this policy and why? Uh, so I have stuff on racist backlash in my rebuttal, but I can go back to that now. A couple of things. Firstly, we think this can be sold to people as stopping illegal immigration, which is really, really disliked right now in the country for a whole, whole bunch of cultural reasons that's pretty strong. Secondly, in terms of we provide economic benefits in the long term, it's probably going to go a pretty substantial way towards fixing that. Thirdly, in terms of illegal immigrants, a lot of the stuff that people are scared about to do with that is things like crime and so on, which aren't directly related to legal immigration. So we think we can actually deal with that backlash to a pretty sensible extent. Cool. So why is this really, really important? Because if you have a massively debt-ridden social entitlement system, two things happen. Either you take on loads and loads of debt, which is really, really bad because it boosts interest rates and increases the financial risk in your country, which means it's really, really hard to get investment into your country in the long term. That's why Republicans are so opposed to debt, more generally as a concept like Ec 101, that shit's true. Secondly, though, the alternative is that um, Come, it is, is the benefits simply won't be paid out in these situations. It is is that literally the whole system will collapse, will be forced not to pay out benefits. So the social consequences of this, those are potentially dire. So those are two key extensions that Danny and I gave you that are going to win this debate. A couple of things that haven't been dealt with so far in battle that need to be dealt with. Firstly, they say it's not going to be possible to compete internationally, therefore none of our benefits hold. Um, Another reason why this isn't true. Firstly, there's no import costs as opposed to someone like China. Secondly, it's much more politically palatable for UK, US politicians to support this. So there's likely to be far, far better business treatment of that. Secondly, it tells workers are likely to be exploited. That ignores the comparative work of immigrants. Danny gives you this in his POI. Like, anonymous reporting solves the POI response to a pretty substantial extent. Ultimately, we help the poorest people in this debate in the most, most helpful way we can only win. Very proud to report this. I thank the member of government for their remarks and call upon the member of the opposition. Here. and why it violates the democracy. This is not something which you're going to talk about backlash, but otherwise it's illegitimate for the government to do so. 
Secondly, why there is a long-term market failure here, and this is something which will just have significantly greater impacts than the open proposition on why essentially the market is going to fail over the long term actually shrink, and thirdly, why it actually harms the basic rights of immigrants and also people who are minorities within the US right and now the battle is integrated. First point. Essentially, this is a unique election that the US has undergone right now. Unlike many other elections, which are many, many different topics and many things that people decide upon, it's really hard to get the intensity of preferences of what people actually desire. This is incorrect for the last ele election cycle in the US. There was actually the predominant question whether the US should be open or closed. This is exactly the contradiction between Clinton and Trump. Essentially, the key policy which the vast majority of Trump supporters under the Electoral College, which is a part of the United States, have supported the Trump version, is the idea of a closer economy. No. And here is something crucial that you need to underline. It is not a utilitarian metric at the heart of this debate. If this was the case, what we should do is take 100% taxation and send the money in foreign aid to Africa in order to make sure that less people are starving. This is not something that the US should do, presumably, under the criteria that is set by the government. Essentially, in a democracy, the public are the sovereign and they have the capacity to decide what are the metrics and what is actually the truth because there is no absolute truth within a modern democratic system. Right? There is no such thing as socialism, socialism being inherently greater than capitalism. Essentially, if the United States actually chooses to prioritize their own values and metric above the capacity to have greater GDP, which is not clearly to be intrinsically greater, this is something which is plainly illegitimate and the utilitarian metric is not the correct one to win it. They say, ah, Fine. but you have an obligation to other people around the world. Cool. This is completely irrelevant to this debate because it's unclear why you have this obligation to these people and how to promote us. And essentially what you say is it's a violation of a right and essentially principally it's enough to win because it's the irrelevant Fine. Fine. But now let's start with what is essentially happening with the economy. Because look, let's take opening government and then closing government at their best in explaining what is actually the trade-off. Because they say, look, we're only going to do it in cases of which you have collapsing industries that pay really, really bad in America not actually want to go and work them. Here is something which is crucial to understand about how this might be better. Because as they identify in the Prime Minister's speech, these are pockets. Because what happens in the US right now is that Florida's origins market is actually quite profitable even for American workers who work there a The milk farmers in America, as you have in the okay. iconic image of your mind, are actually in many, in many cases are Americans who were born in America. Why does that matter? Because essentially, if the Arkansas agricultural market is failing, and now you're giving it the capacity to pay significantly less wages, Essentially what is happening is you're making it much more compatible compared to other agriculture markets within the US who are functioning and who are hiring American workers. So essentially the trade-off here is laying off and reducing the wages of many people who are currently employed. Note, so we simply don't accept the logic that the actual comparative here is only to illegal immigrants. A, because simply speaking that there are many other Trump policies which are likely to pan out as you know subsidizing American workers or massively finding people who hire illegal so therefore there is a way to reduce it, but secondly, because it harms healthy industries within the United States, because the pockets are not isolated. So now five different points of the long-term huge impact on the market failure here. Yes. Many of the swing voters who voted for Obama last cycle but moved for Trump now were willing to support a pro-immigrant politician. No, do you think no, that has no, more... No, we simply, we simply don't accept that based on the logic that we have done. This is something which is simply incorrect based on all of the polls that we have done in the United States. So let's continue. Okay. So, no, let's continue. That's really... Okay. No, independently, we're going to debate on that as well. So let's not continue. Look, what is essentially happening? The cost that is essentially firing a current worker is not portrayed on the employer. And this is something that needs to answer because there is a market failure there. What I mean, if essentially they are for welfare for many people, essentially, if I fire a current American citizen, I need to actually subsidize the amount of work that they're not producing in work in other payments. So essentially, it makes no economic sense. For the employer, there is a clear incentive to pay less. However, this is because they don't have the bill, the cost of the capacity of the entirety of the state to actually subsidize the same amount of money, which is long term, essentially makes no sense because the economy doesn't profit to it on a grand scale. Secondly, in many cases, if you're simply underpaid, as is the analysis that is open to position load, there are other as are other externalities which are not directly formed by the market. The fact that crime is significantly more likely in these cases because people don't have enough in many of these cases to make sure that they have enough to eat or to make sure that the children that might be born here actually have a capacity to be securely fed. Thirdly, look, it just simply doesn't take into account, and this is another issue of the market inherently, the happiness of people in these local communities. And now let's understand something detrimental about this debate. Because they say, oh, but we are going to have an investment in infrastructure which is going to be built up in a 
number of places. But here's the asymmetry. It is significantly more harmful to take away and shrink a current place rather than to build another place. And this is a good comparative here, because why? If we have a current system which is currently working and functioning in one community, let's say the milk farmers of Oregon in many cases, the fact is they already have support systems in place. They already have capacity of functioning. They have more money to invest in order to make sure that other businesses which are directly dependent upon these industries work as well. They already have functioning communities as well that you know and know how to live their lives through and have bonds which are created there together. If, yes. Sure. So your principles won based on democratic sovereignty. Who won the popular vote? So essentially what we say is that the American people have decided that the way that the democracy works here is essentially the electoral college. You may object to that, you may find it appalling, this is a democracy here. In no country you have a clear capacity to have an electoral vote. Like by your logic, the entire democratic system is a problem here. Let's continue. So essentially what is happening here is this is something which is significantly a greater harm to the economy to take away because there is an asymmetry between taking away current communities which are functioning rather than building new ones. Therefore, all in all, the long-term capacity of actually planning it throughout the market forces is going to fail because the economy is likely to suffer a major blow because of all of these reasons. But the third point, right, actually harms actually other citizens and other externalities. Because look, this is something which would like to take a huge amount of political capital. This is likely to be, therefore, which is exclusive any other kind of reform that you might do. And this is something that, in many cases, might also do something else. Because there is a conflation, unfortunately, between people who are migrants who are coming to the country and current minority citizens. Unfortunately, it's a matter of perceptions. But the vast majority of people are not that sophisticated to be able to tell people who are brown from other It's an unfortunate point, but it's a correct point in reality. If you're making a scenario in which these people look like the people, only in perceptions, right? It's incorrect. To be the people who are stealing our jobs, to be the people who get cuts away in order to have a lower wages so they can be employed, these are likely, A, to be harmful to any political capital as an alternative to make sure that their lives are better, but B, to be conflated with other people who are currently minority American citizens because you're going to create a, a, a perception they should earn less in many of these different cases. On all three counts differently, you better do it. I thank you, Member of Opposition, for their remarks and call from the government. Yes. What Archie proved to you in his last speech was the issue of imperative. We told you there are massive global and long-term problems that are occurring, and not only is this policy one way of solving those issues, but it is functionally the best way of solving those issues. The fact that some people might not like this uh, issue, or the fact that Donald Trump won like three random Midwestern states by 10,000 votes each is not enough to overcome that. Three things in this speech. First, refutation of the closing opposition extension. Second, re-articulating what our extension brought to you in this round and why it's the most important. And lastly, refutation of opening opposition, starting on closing opposition. So on this popular sovereignty argument, one, this is absurd. The election was about many issues. It was about her emails. It was about the FBI. Like, by this logic that Trump wins because everything in his platform wins, this means, like, America supports grabbing women's vaginas. So that's not the argument in this debate because it's I mean, unclear to determine what was the deciding factor. Secondly, um, Changing demographics in America mean that the uh, population of white voters is going to continuously de decrease and the population of non-white voters is going to continuously increase, which means in the long term there's likely to be more support for off policy than theirs. And third, she won the popular vote. If your principle is popular sovereignty, then the fact that Hamilton chose to have the Electoral College 200 years ago because he wanted to disenfranchise people and empower smart electors means that's inconsistent with your principle to decide based on the Electoral College. But also we'd say it's not just the public sovereignty because other people around the world functionally make the same sacrifices to the United States where they have to die because of U.S. interventions in their regions, or they have to functionally pay money to the U.S. because of the economic control it has over the world. Given they make a sacrifice, we say they matter, as per the very logic that the LO gave to you in the beginning of the round. Then they say, though, that it's a market failure because there are other agricultural businesses that are doing well. So, like, firstly, we don't perpetuate a problem of failing industries because these industries have to care about other things, like their long-term <coughs> prospects for growth or their ability to make money in the future, which means if it is dying because of the fact, like, the crop isn't profitable, 
profitable or like there's a crop that is sold better in another part of the world. They're still not going to be able to do things like get a good investment or get like a healthy stock price, even if they temporarily lower labor costs, which means we don't perpetuate that problem. But secondly, I'd argue like most agriculture overall in every industry is slowly shifting to mechanization because labor costs are high above, above the world. They haven't explained why labor costs are good in some industries and not good in others beyond merely asserting that. We solve this problem overall. But then they say the employer doesn't bear the cost of welfare. So firstly, even if this is the case, like we say it is comparatively good that employers are not overburdened for the cost of welfare because if they're able to do things like raise profits and then we're able to tax those profits to fund welfare systems, then you even out the cost overall. But the second response is they do bear the cost. Like if a lot of local people in their community are unemployed or unhappy with the employer or are not able to purchase their goods, then it makes it harder for those into that company to prosper in that specific environment, which means they do have some incentive to care about these costs. Then lastly, they say there's a political capital trade-off. Um, three responses. One, I'll explain in our extension why this policy is really good, so we're fine if this is something worth losing your seat over, essentially. The second thing, though, is that the benefit to visas is that uh, if you are in the country and you are able to get some type of money, and maybe then you're able to do that, use that to do something like get an education, there's a possibility, increased possibility, you stay in the country. That helps increase the types of people that would support pro-minority policies by changing population rates and demographics, which means we get more political support on our side of the house. But thirdly, it's unclear why different minority issues are connected. Like African Americans, their issues are not the same as Hispanic Americans because they care about things like police brutality or over-incarceration, and they haven't directly explained why this is the case. Um, besides a political backlash argument, which I'll respond to when I get to opening opposition. So, what did we bring you on closing government, and how do we extend past OG? First on geography, second on time. On geography, we told you the key thing that's different between the two sides is that this money is able to go back to other parts of the world easier when you are not an undocumented immigrant, but instead someone there in a visa. Because both of the fact that when it, you are undocumented, you often have to do things like pay off someone to help you get across the border and pay for security costs. So that is the reason there's debt that OO actually talks about. And secondly, because you are easier to integrate yourself into the financial system, which actually gets you growth. Purchasing power disparities between the United States and the poorest parts of the world, like Honduras and Guatemala, are huge. So the human impact, if they say that's so important, is when like the average wage of someone in their country is two or three dollars, and you are able to send like fifty cents. You are increasing their income by like some proportion of math that I don't know how to do at the top, but huge, significant portion. That means people are able to buy food. That means people are able to do things like start businesses in that economy. You materially substantially improve their quality of life. And given that these people have made similar sacrifices to the U.S., we say that's worth it. We also say that's worth the trade-off they talked about in terms of minorities because the benefit is huge. Like, it's unclear what the U.S. political process, gradual reform, will substantially change the lives of minorities. Remittances do that by bypassing, bypassing that process. The second thing, though, we extend, and, and OG is only about benefits within the United States. We say the greatest marginal impact is remittances outside. Second thing that we extend upon is time, because even if OG makes the economy a little bit more efficient in the short term or solves one industry, we say the most pressing problem in the United States is the population crisis. People are getting older and living longer. That means they're consuming more in entitlements. At the same time, birth rates go down, so there are fewer people to pay for those entitlements. The long-term impact of this is the U.S. accumulates more and more debt to fund this. Um, yes? We told you for a range of structural reasons that in reality these, these workers would be so indentured in servitude that it would be unlikely to be able to send enough money for remittances, let alone for their own lives. Additionally, there were large costs about political climate that hurt both legal yep. and illegal immigrants. I'll, I'll Give me the first opposite. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Respond. Yep, uh, later. But So the impact of this is that you keep, interest rates go up because you have to keep servicing debt and because savers now demand more because there are fewer of them and more people trying to borrow money. That means it's harder to do something like take out a loan to start a business. It means it's harder to do things like guarantee that like Mama Dubois gets her social security check because it's unclear you can pay for it. That's the human impact that they don't deal with on their side of the house. Upcoming crisis. Opening opposition. So first argument about illegal immigrants and how it's their indentured super bad. Firstly, we say the places they're likely going are places where the cost of living is small, so the low wage is not a problem. That's because the characterization we get is places like North Dakota or South Dakota that are agrarian, so they're not an expensive city like New York, or like a dying factory town in Cleveland, Ohio. So we say there's less money. The second thing is that you get more flexibility because you have legal protection. Employers can threaten to report you if you quit their job. Their response is that requires them to admit guilt. But one, they can still make the threatens. Unclear and undocumented worker would make that gamble. And two, it doesn't matter because even, uh, they can report anonymous especially in the current Trump administration, I think they're going to care more about getting the undocumented immigrants out, which means these people are harmed. Then in terms of political backlash, responding to both of them. Two reasons were comparatively better. 
The first is that we are likely to have more gradual change. On their side of the house, when the key difference is labor, an entire factory has to shut down and a bunch of people are immediately out of jobs. Maybe on our side of the house, that factory slowly transitions uh, Americans with immigrants. But that's comparatively better because there's at least time to adjust versus the immediate political shock that you target towards one person and use that to vote the other way. The second thing is that this solves the problem of undocumented workers by getting people into the legal system, changing that narrative as well. So given that undocumented people exist either way, we are comparatively better. Um, I think the government whipped their remarks and called on the opposition whip to close up the round. supersedes what is best for the economy. Otherwise, we would think it is legitimate to overcome and by power take away the government's force when they're making mistakes. I assume most people in this room objected to Trump winning the, the, uh, the elections. However, most of, them would, most of you would also object to Obama saying, I currently hold the powers of government, therefore I will use them to not allow Trump to come into office, right? Because we value the fact that the democratic responsibility of government supersedes the consequential results of making bad policy decisions. If we win that this is what the American people want and we can know that, we win this debate regardless of what happens. And just because Americans like to hear this, that means we've been opening up government, and we've been opening opposition, and we've been closing <laughs> government. <laughs> that all the real government <laughs> by this policy. The only attack we got on that was when closing government said, oh, but electoral college is very terrible and we don't buy that. We don't need the electoral college. How do we know that? A, note that closing government, before they realize we are winning this debate at this point, concede that they disagree, that, that there will be backlash and people disagree, that Trump supporters do it because of this reason, and therefore they agree with us. Two, note that both Trump and Hillary very, clear, very clearly stated they will enact protectionist policies because of what the public wanted. Trump won the primaries because he was claiming that we should build a wall. He was clearly the most protectionist and had a Point. huge victory despite a lot of flaws that his electoral, electoral uh, 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 voters didn't like. And even Hillary, which clearly supported things like the TTP and NAFTA and so on, made a pivot for her to be democratically viable. We know as a fact that the, 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 the people of the United States do not want open borders. You can say shit about the Electoral College, it does not matter. We know this is true, and this is enough to win this debate. Point so point. now, let's assume we ignore democracy and talk why, even in terms of economics, it's not a good idea to do this policy. So look, opening government comes and gives us some weird economic analysis. Most of it genuinely falls to basic economics. I know one of our chairs knows this basic economics, but I'll explain it to everyone. So somehow they claim that even though it's not worth paying them more than $2, not paying them minimum wage, this will have a booming effect on the economy. And when they're attacked on that, they try to run away from that. I'll take you in a moment. They try to run away from that by talking about dependencies, talking about how it also affects retailers, and retailers will then pay others. But if another retailer, if someone you know, does some agriculture work for $2 an hour, they can now pay full wages to dozens of workers with those profits, obviously they can pay for those people to do those original jobs minimum wage. It does not make economic sense just because those dependencies lead you to somewhere else in the economy to say somehow you magically create money but cannot pay that money to workers. From their analysis on why you cannot pay these people more than $2, it applies that their benefits have to be small. You want to defend yourself, opening up. Sure. So your like, principle is that like, Trump voters want their communities to be rejuvenated. We should respect that will. We outlined a policy that rejuvenated communities because we're not paying these people $2 an hour. We're just paying them margin less than minimum wage to do productive jobs that will create new jobs for the economy and help those communities The fear overall. of open borders is that people who take less wages will take their jobs. We know that. You cannot say, oh, but we magically make everything better, so that's what people want. Democracy works not by doing the 
the best results, but by, by, and, and therefore people will be happy so we don't need to ask them, but doing what the people want. You do not take down our principles, and know that they don't seem to want to defend against what I just said about why their case doesn't make kind of sense. Opening opposition come up and say, and give us a, quite, quite a nice amount of costs of this policy, right? Mainly talking about how some, of the, some other American workers will be priced out of this policy, and we think they do a very good job. That extends on that and improves on that in three major ways. One, he talks to you about a large extent of long-term consequences. He talks about the fact that it is not only losing the job right now, but there is a substantial difference in the ability of worker of American workers to then a ex escape the uh, the unemployment circle to uh, and so on. He explains to you why, if you invest more in dying industries like this policy does, that has a bad effect on the economy as a whole and means that the United States cannot develop and or as effectively and create new jobs. Secondly, he explains to you why even this proposal influences workers broadly, because opening government come up with a relatively scare, kind of a, a weak proposal and say only when no American workers, in, all, in very specific areas, only then will we bring them. Uh, that explains to you why this has a strong influence on others. Note, this is strongly, that analysis is strongly supported by opening government's own analysis on dependencies. The fact that they claim that these workers and their pricings affect retailer markets, right, we don't think it can affect them to the extent that they want, but that means that those prices price changes go down the line, right? The fact that you can pay people less money goes down the line and affects retail industries. We've heard this response said, oh, but we don't care about agriculture. Agriculture is one example. This is true in low industry, and this is true about all the other markets that are affected according to the analysis of opening government, whose prices are now lowered and now cannot afford to pay the minimum wage to actual American workers. So the influences of this policy, despite being relatively weak, end up being strong because of the analysis we get from opening government. Thirdly, no thank you, let's talk about, uh, that also asks you why this is necessarily a bad idea. And that is because of uh, uh, a, a market of failure, but first clothing. Yeah, so if your argument is that it's bad to have American workers becoming unemployed, is it worse when they all become unemployed because a factory moves to another country, or better to have a slow, gradual shift via our policy? Two answers to that. One is, we don't accept that factors are leaving because you don't bring in internal workers. Note. Given this policy, what you're doing is you're saying in those areas that people don't work anyway, this is the only place where we're putting these people in. We don't see any difference in factories leaving. But secondly, since oppositions, sorry, since governments will not defend lower minimum wage, it seems that you guys think that the standard of living of Americans is worth it, even if some factories go away. So we don't accept that line of analysis. Thirdly, as I mentioned, that explains to you the market failure that's going on here. What does that mean? It means that when we take external workers, and closing government don't understand this analysis, it means that much of the costs of those workers are not paid by those employers. Why is that important? Because it's not just, you know, opening government give us advantages, closing government give us disadvantages. That explains why we're creating an incentive structure in the market where people are consistently making economic decisions whose costs are paid by the government. Yes, as citizens, they also pay it, but the vast majority of that payment is not from their pocket, and their gains do go to their pocket. We are creating an incentive structure where people do things that are bad for the economy, and he gave you a lot of analysis on that. It is undemocratic, it's unwise economically, and that already explains why we can't, why we don't prioritize others over ourselves. We beg to